Good day to be in church, right? Man, uh, we're continuing our Roman series, and uh, we've gone through eight verses of Romans 12, and uh, last week we had a guest speaker named Gene. How awesome was Gene last week? Come on. I, I left just encouraged and fired up to keep going, and we're going to go through four verses today. We're going to go through verses 9 and through 13, uh, and Paul, what Paul's about to do is he's about to give a, a list of exhortations. He's about to just give us a list of things on how we should respond to the world, how we should live our life, how, how we should act on a daily basis, and if you're someone who wants to memorize Scripture wants to have a piece of scripture that's just tattooed on your heart to help you in a day-to-day -day manner, the next, the next uh, eight verses we go through over the next two weeks are powerful. So I, I just challenge you, if that's you, go home and just memorize these words because they are life-changing. Let's jump into it. So verse nine, it's up on the screen behind me or we're in the NLT version if you want to follow along uh, with me. Verse nine says this, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong, holding tight to what is good. Man, what a convicting passage right off the bat. Verse nine, don't just pretend. Everybody say, pretend. pretend. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Man, I, I could just stay on that. The Christian love, this love that comes from us as Christians should be genuine. It should be authentic. It should be without hypocrisy or deception. It should just be an authentic, true love. And I don't know about you, has anybody kind of been jaded by the world to kind of be skeptical of everything? Anybody like me in that? When you see someone doing something nice, you're like, is that real? Is that real? And I'll, I'll be honest, this is my kid's fault. <laughs> This is my kid's fault why this has happened to me. Because I remember when they were young, like one years old, every time they would cry in their room, I would rush into the room. And I'd be ready to like, I became a doctor almost every night. Like, tell me what's wrong. It's an emergency. And then as years went by, my kids became three and a half, now four. They started this thing where in the middle of the night when they wake up, they will just scream at the top of their lungs. They, they're, they're right down, they will just scream. And uh, please mute the mic a little bit, I'm about to get loud. They'll say, Daddy! Daddy! And they'll just keep going. And I remember the first time they did it, I like kicked the door down. I was like, ah, what's wrong? I thought somebody was in their room and then my daughter looks at me and she's like, I'm thirsty. <laughs> what? I thought there was like someone in your room. And now it's gotten to the point where they're screaming and I look over at my wife and I'm like, ah, they'll be fine. Let them scream. You know, like sometimes we can become this way with our Christian life and how we view things like genuine love. What is that? We could become jaded and hard to it because we've been burnt or we've seen people be burnt or we've seen people use the name of Jesus and misuse it. We've seen that. So I wanna talk a little bit about what is this love? What is this genuine, what is this real love that he's talking about here? Well, here's a couple of things it's not. This love is not for gain. This love is not for a personal gain that when, when, I, when I'm showing this real authentic love, I shouldn't be gaining from it. It's not, it's not for a position. I'm not loving someone so I can better my position. I'm not playing the game and just doing the right steps so I can better my position around people around me in the body of Christ so I can look a certain way. Uh, it's not for attention. This love, if, if the driver for how you love people is you can make a social media post and everyone's gonna give you the like button, gotta check yourself. Is that why you're doing it? Is that the driver? And it is not for fulfilling a duty. This love is not a checkbox in our life. This love is not something I can just do and do once and say, check, I'm done. I genuinely love the people of God. That's what it's not. So let's talk about what it is. The first thing it is, is it's from God. True love comes from God. It says this in uh, 1 John 4, 7. It says, dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. This true, authentic love that he's talking about only comes from being in relationship with our Heavenly Father. Because if we wanna to learn to love like our Father tells us to love, we have to be close to him. Do you get what I'm saying? My kids soak up 
everything I do in life because they're around me. They soak up some of the bad things. They soak up the good things I do. But the great thing about our God, the more we're with him, the more we will soak up his heart. We'll soak up his character and we can start to act in this genuine love. The second thing it is, is this love is patient. This love is patient. It's not in a rush. This is not a microwave type love that we can hit one minute on the microwave and that person will feel love. This is a patient love that is willing to go slow, to, to stop our own pace and to slow down for someone else. The third thing this is, is this love is honest. True love is truthful. True love is truthful. This isn't judgmental, but this is truthful, meaning saying that I love you too much to allow you to stay there. Anybody had that conversation? I love you so much that I, I gotta speak this truth into your life because you're not seeing it. And I love you too much to let you stay there. And the fourth thing about this love is this love is action-based. This love is all about action. It's more than words. It says this in 1 John verses three, uh, chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Dear, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. Here's the thing about when it comes to love. When, when we are engaging with people, and God puts people in our life that he wants us to genuinely love, to genuinely be in relationship with, to have this godly love for them. Often what we do is we stand on our platform and we say, you come to me. You, if you, you're gonna feel my love, you need to look like me. You need to act like me. You need to fix your life so you can be more like me. But that's not what Christ did at all. What Christ did was he left heaven and came down to earth. He had every right to stay in the throne room of heaven, but he chose to come down and become like us, living life with us, walking with us side by side. Let me put this in a different perspective. Hold on one sec. Someone's about to be really mad at me, but it's okay. Here's what Christ did. When, when he came down, he left his position he left, he left heaven and he came down to earth. Just like this. It was probably a bigger journey than that. And he came down and he came down to humanity. How are you? Are you okay that I'm doing this? All right. What's your name? Jose. Jose. My name's Shane. Nice to meet you. And what Jesus did was he came down to humanity and he said, let me live shoulder to shoulder with you. Let me show you the right way to do things. Let me lead by example. What he didn't do was stay off in the distance and say, you get better. You, you, you act this way. Let me love you from a distance. He came down to earth and was right there with us. So us as Christ followers, when we live our life this way, we need to take this approach. That as we love someone, like I love my brother Jose here, I'm not gonna love him from over there. I'm gonna love him from right here, right next to him. And whatever pace he's going at, I'm gonna be patient with him. Whatever truth he needs in his life, I'm gonna be truthful with him. But I'm not gonna do it from over there, I'm gonna do it right here, living life with him. If we could get this as the body of Christ, that it's not us ahead of everyone else, it's us stopping and saying, let me go to you. Just like Christ did, right, Jose? Could we make some noise for Jose? Thank you so much, I'm serious. And so what, what Jesus did in this moment is he came down to earth. When we think about what is this true, genuine love, it's that. It's, it's leaving my own perceptions of the world. It's, it's leaving my own desires. It's leaving my own timeline. It's leaving my own plan for the day and saying, wherever God puts me, I'm going to be shoulder to shoulder with that person. And so as we continue to read it then goes on to say this, hate what is wrong. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Hate? That's not allowed in church, is it? How do we go from love, genuine love, to hate? Hate what is wrong. It, I, I remember growing up and hearing about church and thinking that you couldn't even say the word hate in church. I even feel weird saying it right now. 
You couldn't say this word, but there is things in our life that if we are going to be genuine in our love, we have to hate. I know it sounds weird, but there's things in us that we can't, inside of our life, we can't just brush under the rug. We have to hate that part that's in us. It's things like this, we, sin. The, we, the more that we learn to hate the sin and the actions of our life, the more we, we fall in love with the grace of Jesus. Amen. The more that we stop settling with living a life that looks like the world and acts like the world and talks like the world, we learn to understand how magnificent the grace is of Jesus. But you can't understand that if you're rationalizing the sin in your life. Because if you're rationalizing the sin and you're saying it's not that bad, it's okay, you're, you're rationalizing the size of Jesus' grace. We have to not be okay and be just settled with that sin in our life. We have to learn to have that hatred. Now it's not hatred of myself. I can't believe I'm a sinner. I hate myself for sinning. That's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is just hating that thing that we're doing to the point where it causes change in our life. This isn't shame, this isn't self-hatred. This is looking at a part of my life that is separating me from the grace of Jesus and saying I'm not gonna stand for that. The other thing in our life is we have to hate hypocrisy. We have to hate hypocrisy. Anybody ever heard this? The church is full of a bunch of hypocrites. That's true. We, we, <laughs> that's true. You know, there's things in my life that I'm a hypocrite about. There's things in your life that you're a hypocrite about. We can't just settle for it. We can't just say, okay, that's who I am. You're like, I'm not a hypocrite. Well, let me say this. Have you ever walked by someone and said, I'll pray for you? And you don't? Hypocrite. <laughs> you know, like, I, there's, this, it, it sounds silly, but this was a huge part of my life. Because I, you know, I work in the church. I'm in the lobby. And people would come up to me. Hey, Shane, can you be praying for this? Can you be praying for this? Yeah, I'll pray for you. And the next week I would see him like, I did not do that. And I, I had to learn to hate that. That I needed to be a man of my word. That if someone asked for prayer in their life, I was not just gonna say the right words, I was gonna engage in that. So I stopped doing that. I said, okay, when someone comes and asks me for a prayer, they better be ready to pray right then. Because I'm not gonna remember. So hey, you come to ask me for prayer in the lobby, you better be ready to pray, because we're praying. Let me tell you a cool story. I didn't ask for permission for this, but I'm gonna do it anyway. A man came to me two weeks ago, three weeks ago, in the lobby, right before I was about to preach. Right before I was about to preach, he said, can you pray for my sister? She's in the hospital right now, she's having heart problems, she's having complications with her heart, but I literally had to walk up on stage. I walked up on stage and the first thing I did was pray for him, pray for his sister. Last week, I saw him and his sister in the lobby. In the lobby. And, and she says, it's an amazing story. I don't want to go into all the details, but I don't want to just settle for the hypocrisy in my life. It might be that, but is there things in your life that you're just saying? You're playing the game. You're doing all the right things. And the other thing is we have to hate the enemy. We, ha we have to not be okay with allowing the enemy to lie to us. One of my pastor friends put it really well. Don't allow him to have a seat at your table. He's not welcome there. He's trying to deceive you, he's trying to take you off course. Don't let him sneak into your life. You have to, you have to be vigilant and awake. You can't just play that game. You're saying, Shane, why, why do you keep saying play the game? Because we as Christians, especially the American church, have been, become really good at that. Coming in, saying the right things, acting the right way, waving to the right people, but there's things in us that we have to not settle for. Because where we're gonna spend eternity, there's no games there. There's no games in heaven. You can't play that. You have to be real and authentic with this. And then it says later on in this verse, hold fast to what is good. If we're gonna to learn to hate these areas, we have to hold fast to what is good, and is there anything more good than Jesus Christ? If you want to grow and move in these areas, you have to practice a life that is holding fast, meaning locked in, connected to Jesus. 
You can't do this on your own. I can't do this on my own. I need to be clinged on to Jesus, holding fast. The thing that just sticks out to me when I read this passage, it's like I'm in a storm. I'm in a, anybody seen that movie Twister back in the day? And they, they, the, the tornado comes rolling through the city and they seatbelt themselves to a metal pole. The tornado goes right over them and they make it. The whole town's destroyed, but he makes it. If I ruined the movie for you, it was made in the 80s, so that's your fault. That's what it's, hold fast to Jesus. Seatbelt yourself to him so that no matter what storm, no matter what hardship, no matter what lie the enemy does, you can hold fast to him even in the midst of that, amen? amen? Verse 10, I gotta get going quick or we're gonna, you guys are gonna be late for lunch. <laughs> Verse 10, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Love each other with genuine affection and this love that it's talking about is different than the love that it was talking about a couple verses ahead. This love is talking about the, the body of Christ. Love each other with genuine affection. We, this is love, this is like a family love. This is like a brother, sister, mom, dad type of family love. And here's the truth about the church. We are not all blood relatives, right? You are not my uncle, Donald. You know, like you're not. But in the body of Christ, we are all blood relatives because we share in the blood of Jesus Christ. So we should approach each other as family. We are not separate. We are under one covering, and that is the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. And we need to love each other like family. We need to love each other like family. And some of you, when I say the word family, when I say the word father, when I, say, when I, when I talk about this, you have a broken family here on earth. And, and the moment we start talking about that, stuff stirs up in you. I get it. But Jesus and the family of God is not broken. Jesus is perfect in every way. Jesus loves you in a way you can't understand, you can't even grasp. He loves you so much. And when you say that my family's broken, it hurts, come to Jesus in it. Because he, he will wrap you up, the body of Christ, if we're acting the right way and loving the right way, we're gonna wrap you up because like I said, we might not be blood relatives here on earth, but we share the blood of Jesus. And we need to love each other that way. As we continue to read, it says this, and take delight in honoring each other. The translation here, and take delight in honoring each other, means actually to outdo each other outdo each other in honoring one another. Like, I, as I read this, I was like, outdo in honoring. I wanna be one of those people that's just going around person to person and just like, hey, I'm gonna honor you today. It doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. I'm gonna honor you. I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show you love. I'm gonna show you support. And we are so guilty of, in our life, in, the, in this journey of life, we are sometimes guilty of doing something once checking that box and not living it out going forward. This outdoing, this take delight in honoring each other is not a checkbox for the one time. It's a day in, day out lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. Last night I was watching the Duke North Carolina game. Anybody watch that? Okay. Uh, it was Coach K's last game. One of the most winningest coaches of all time. He's the coach of Duke University. It was his last home game. And afterwards, he was doing an interview. And in his last game, everybody was kind of pulling for the, he's going to win. There's going to be this dramatic win. And Coach K is going to go out on top. That didn't happen. He lost. His team lost pretty good, too. It was like 10 points. Not a close game. So he's doing the interview. And at the end, where all the people are celebrating and cheering him and all of his past accomplishments. And he says this line, hold on, let me stop this. He says, I am sorry for today. And the whole crowd's like, no, no, it's okay. No, it's not okay. We should have won today. It doesn't matter what I've done in my history. What mattered was today's game. What mattered was today's game. It just stood out to me as we lived this life of showing honor and day in, day out, outdoing each other. We can't rely on our past. This is a today thing. 
This is a live action thing. We have to live it out daily. Verse 11 says this, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Never be lazy. Conviction. That was, I mean, for me, sorry. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. This is talking about this dynamic Christianity. This, this, this Christ loving life that is so dynamic, enthusiastic. When you're around someone who's living this way, it's contagious. Anybody ever encountered someone like that? That they're just contagious with the gospel of Jesus. When you're walking with them, it doesn't matter what hardship you're in, you feel hopeful for the future. This enthusiastic, dynamic Christianity. Let me paint a picture for you. I played college football, and football happens in the winter. And when I was away at college, there was one night where it snowed all night, almost a foot of snow on the ground on the football field. I find myself 6 a.m. the next day in a sweater, like three pairs of sweats, my head down, just grumpy to be there. I didn't want to be there. It was cold. I don't like the cold. So I moved to Reno. <laughs> and so I find myself there, and one of my teammates comes in the middle of the snow with his shirt off, just chanting, Woo! Let's go, boys! Let's go! He's slapping hands and he gets to me. I'm like, nah. I'm just here so I don't have to run later. He's going around and he starts to ask people this question that has just stuck with me my whole life. He's going around to people and he says, hey, you got your lunch pail? You got your lunch pail? And he gets to me, he's got your lunch pail? I was like, no, it's not lunchtime. It's 6 a.m. He says, if you don't got your lunch pail, you're not clocked in. You're not ready. You're not ready to be better today. You're not ready to be the best self. And he starts getting me fired up. He's like, you're right. I was like, I need to be better today. I gotta give practice, because there's a goal. And he asked me again, Shane, you got your lunch pail. I got it, I'm ready. And I, that might not make sense to you, but then it's something started. Every practice, he would come around to practice and he would carry a lunch pail. He would carry it. And as we got ready to go, he'd say, you got your lunch pail. And we would respond with, yes, I do. And what he was saying was, have you done everything to get ready for today? Because when you go to work, and you know, what he was paying the vision to is when you go to work, you bring your lunch pail with you because you're prepared to work hard. You're prepared to stay in the office. You don't have time to go to lunch, because you're doing big things that day. You brought your lunch with you. So he would ask us that, and what he's saying is, is do you, did you prepare for today? Are you ready for what's gonna happen to you today? How does that apply to us as Christians? Are we enthusiastic? Are, are, are we excited? for our day when it comes to living for Jesus? Have we prepared? Have we brought our lunch pail with us daily as we go into the world? Or are we, like me, in the cold, arms crossed, just getting through the day? You got your lunch pail? Have you spent time with Jesus? Did you wake up today and the first thing that ran through your head was I need to talk to my God? Did, did you wake up today and think that, how am I gonna love people today? We gotta ask ourselves, are we going into today prepared? Are we going into today enthusiastic? Are we excited about Jesus? I, like, I, I, I know I'm, I'm hovering here, but this is huge. When we fall in love with Jesus, this shouldn't be something that we just drag our feet with. Man, Jesus is good. He set me free from a lot of stuff, so it's cool. No, this is like a, Jesus is good. Like, I'm so excited that what Jesus has done in me, I can't contain it. I got my lunch pail. I'm ready to take on the world. We have to be enthusiastic about it. Verse 12 says this. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. 
Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. What I see here is three C's. What it's calling us to do is to be confident in the future. Be confident in our future hope. If you wanna live this enthusiastic, excited life for Jesus, you have to stay confident in the glory to come because life's gonna get hard. Things are gonna happen to you that are gonna hurt. You're gonna get distracted. You're gonna get lonely. But you have to be confident in our future hope. Are you coming up here or are you just driving a seat? Okay. <laughs> Pastor Dan, he's here. Uh, Greet it, Shane. <laughs> Sorry. I love this man. God has a plan. We have to be consistent under pressure. That when the pressures of this world hit us, we have to be consistent, remembering who he is, to be patient in trouble, knowing that the trouble we're in is only for a season. We can do it because we have a God that loves us too much to leave us there. We have a Holy Spirit living inside of us that is walking with us, directing us, helping us along the journey. Be patient. Don't try to rush the process. Maybe the season you're in, God's still working on you in. Be patient. And the third and final C is this. We need to be constant in prayer. It says to keep on praying. We need to be constant in prayer. This fact that we have the opportunity to every day fall to our knees in front of the creator of the universe and talk to him. How amazing is that? I never want to forget this, that it's my calling in life my, to love him, to be with him. I need to be in communication with him. I need to be allowing him to speak to me, to direct me. We need to keep on praying. And I'll close with this, because the enemy is going to try to distract us from this. He doesn't want us talking to God. He wants us off on our own, wandering and lonely. But we need to keep on praying. Don't give the enemy a seat at your table. Amen? Amen. And verse, verse 13 says this. As we close with this, it says, When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. When God's people are in need, be ready. Get your lunch pail. Because if you aren't ready, you're not clocked in. Amen?